The Canadian Pacific Railroad had legions of SD-40s, 555 to be exact, 65 SD-40s and 490 2 models which together arguably made up one of the largest concentrations of a single diesel locomotive model on any railroad roster. The SD40-2 is widely heralded as the greatest diesel locomotive that was ever built, and January 2022 represents 50 years since the model was introduced to the railroads. I'm Railfan AC, and you're watching Trains in the 21st Century. Years before the Norfolk Southern unveiled its 20 heritage diesels to the world in 2012 and before the Union Pacific had its six heritage locomotives before that, the Canadian Pacific had its own heritage fleet in northeastern Pennsylvania. Fitting since the Delaware and Hudson was the product of the very first rail ventures in America. Its original Penn Division main line which ran through Carbondale, Pennsylvania to Nineveh, New York and east to Albany was abandoned in favor of the ex-Lackawanna line which runs from Taylor Yard north to Binghamton and east to Oneonta and Albany and north to Montreal, Quebec in Canada. At least two EMD Jeeps were repainted in the DNH's famous blue and gray lightning stripe livery that was not only one of the sharpest paint schemes in the region but was also a favorite among many rail fans. Units number 7303, which had gold lettering, and number 7312, which had blue lettering, like the DNH itself, operated in relative obscurity when compared to the waves made by the announcement of UP's and NS's heritage fleets. And now, as CP has long since departed northeastern Pennsylvania for good and took what was left of the original DNH with it, we get a glimpse of a railroad that not only survived in an era when most of its neighbors were collapsing into Conrail but also a legacy of a bridge line that now serves two masters. When compared to the dazzling colors of Norfolk Southern's heritage fleet, its black and white diesels don't stir up a whole lot of excitement in most rail fans, but there are some diesels that stand out from the rest and are deserving of a spotlight all of their own. On the NSDNH Sunbury line, there's a small group of locomotives that have been given a heritage status that's unique to this historical railroad. I call them the DNH class. 
blessed with one of the sharpest paint schemes in the Northeast region and an acknowledged rail fan for a chief executive, the Delaware and Hudson was the bright spot in Northeastern railroading during the dark days of the collapse of its neighbors into Conrail. But alas, despite its most valiant efforts to survive as an independent carrier, the blue and gray couldn't compete with the big blue. This prompted a rocky romance with the Guilford Rail System in 1984 as well as a short fling with the Susquehanna around 1989 before falling under the control of the Canadian Pacific in 1990. And though not a railroad known for its heritage units, it could be argued that Canadian Pacific started the heritage game when it restored a few D&H locomotives to their original paint for use on the line. The Electromotive Division of General Motors began to develop its 50 series of 4-axle and 6-axle locomotives in the mid to late 1970s. It was a transitional model in more than one respect. The 50s were the last to use the 645 engine and the first to use the new Super Series wheel slip control system. The use of the Super Series on the 50s was implemented just before the microprocessor era was ushered in on the 60 series locomotives that followed. Facing increased competition from General Electric, EMD decided to push the 645 prime mover further than it had ever gone before to 3,500 and eventually 3,600 horsepower. The extra power would be sent to the new D87 traction motors that boosted the continuous ratings by more than 10% compared with the older D77 traction motors. To develop the new model, EMD produced both 4 and 6 axle prototypes called the GP40X of which 23 were built in late 1977 and early 1978 and the SD40X of which 4 were made. Both locomotives were strikingly different from their 40 series predecessors. The GP40X featured flared radiators and almost half of them rode on the new HTB truck design while the SD40X had a lengthened long hood to accommodate the relocation of the dynamic brakes from above the engine to behind the cab. Both were built on the existing frame length of the GP40-2 and SD40-2, though production SD50s, following the delivery of six Norfolk and Western SD50S units on an SD40-2 length frame, would be built on a frame that was about two feet longer than the SD40-2. The prototypes were built and painted for the railroad they would test on, with four GP40Xs going to the Southern Pacific, six to the Union Pacific, 10 to the Santa Fe, and 3 to the Southern Railway. Four SD40X locomotives painted in Kansas City Southern Colors were delivered in 1979. Unfortunately, reliability problems plagued the 50 series diesel, so the locomotives never truly replaced the widely successful 40 series locomotives that came before them. Because of this, EMD never took the 40 series diesels off of the books, and both the 40 and 50 series were sold side by side during the life of the GP50 SD50 production. Ironically, the last GP40-2 and SD40-2 orders came after production ended on the 50 series in the mid-1980s. The 50 series had several unique models and applications. The first was the previously mentioned high adhesion HTB trucks under the SP and UP GP40Xs designed to address several issues with older truck designs but was never ordered by a railroad. The Southern Pacific GP40Xs were also delivered with experimental elephant ears over the radiators, drawing cooler air near the frame while the units ran through tunnels. A single order for four worth car body SD50s for the Canadian National was built called the SD50F. Burlington Northern ordered five GP50s with larger cabs to accommodate extra crew members in the mid-1980s when cabooses were being eliminated. Designed but never built was a GP50 derivative for the Rio Grande using the successful SD45 T-2 tunnel motor radiator design called the GP50T. Today, only a handful of short lines still use the GP50s and SD50s and three of the seven class one railroads still roster 50 series units, the BNSF, the CSX, and the Kansas City Southern. KCS had both the SD40X and SD50 models, but all original units have been retired. Many of BNSF's units have upgraded electronics and or have been re-rated to either 2500 or 2950 horsepower and reclassified as a different configuration. 
The re-rated units use the GP25 and GP25X model designations and upgraded GP50s are now called GP50-3s. BNSF increased its GP50 fleet in 2017 with the purchase of two second-hand GP50s. The units were cycled through the company's Topeka shops and released for service that summer. Nine locomotives were built as test beds for EMD's new 3,000 horsepower 645 series engine and AR-10 alternator using SD35 frames. They were classified by EMD as the SD40X. The first EMDX number 434 was built at the start of the SD35 production in 1964. The radiator intakes were slightly longer than on the SD35, but not as long as on the SD40, and there were three closely spaced 48-inch radiator fans on the roof. This unit later became Gulfmobile and Ohio number 950, and eventually Illinois Central number 6071, and has been preserved following retirement from active service in 2009. Six more were built in early 1965 and numbered EMDX's number 434A through 434F alongside a single GP40X numbered EMDX number 433A built on a GP35 frame. As the radiator section of the first test bed was too long for the GP35 hood, 433A and 434A through 434F all used canted radiator intakes that were the same length as on the GP35 slash SD35, resulting in three closely spaced 48-inch fans located very near the end of the long hood. This radiator design was later used on the GP40P that was built for the Central Railroad of New Jersey. These units also used the wider exhaust stack housing that would later be used on the 40 series units. The last two SD40Xs, EMDXs number 434G and 434H, were built at the same time as the 434E and 434F and introduced the radiator design that was ultimately adopted for the SD40 with flat radiator intakes significantly longer than any of the earlier units, allowing for the fans to be slightly further apart. The eight later demonstrators were sold to the Union Pacific and numbered 3040 through 3047 in the middle of Union Pacific's other SD40 units. One of them, number 3046, was still in service in 2020 on the Wheeling and Lake Erie. One thing that I need to point out, these early SD40 demonstrators are not to be confused with the GP40X and the SD40Xs built in the late 1970s which were the test beds for the EMD50 series that we just talked about. And this is a westbound train on the Conrail. Well, no, yeah, yeah, it's still Conrail at this time on the Conrail Southern Tier. But what we're interested in today is that middle unit. That is a rare PLM unit. Now, PLM stood for Preferred Lease Management. And there were only 10 of those units. At least there were only 10 of them at the time. I don't know if they've since gotten more. I don't even know if they're even still in existence. But at the time, they only had 10 of them. And this particular engine ran up and down the Delaware and Hudson a lot, ran right through here, right on our own Sunbury line. It ran through there a lot. And you can see it here now heading westbound to Buffalo, New York on a Conrail trackage rights train, or a CP rail slash Conrail trackage rights train. I say CP, it's a CP rail train on utilizing Conrail trackage rights. Getting back to these PLM engines, there were only 10 of these engines. And they were all ex-Missouri Pacific or Union Pacific. So, and I guess you could say in essence they were all ex-Union Pacific, but some of them were originally Missouri Pacific. They weren't numbered consecutively like you would expect, like say, like the class unit of these engines was 3,000. Now, but it didn't go 3,000, 3,001, 3,002, 3,003, you get the picture. It went just like this. 3,000, 3,004, 3,018, 
3021, 3029, 3041, 3052, 3058, and 3104. Now 3000 and 3004 were ex-Missouri Pacifics. 3018, 3021, and 3029, they were Union Pacifics. 3041 was a Union Pacific too, but there was something special about that engine, and we'll get back to that. 3052 was a Union Pacific, 3058 was a Missouri Pacific, and 3104 was a Union Pacific. Getting back to the 3041, that's not your average SD40. That was actually a Union Pacific SD40X. Not a whole lot's told about these engines except the fact that they did run on the CP DNH back in the 90s. I'm not sure when the last one stopped running through here, but when CP took over the line, you saw a lot of lease power. You mostly saw the red and yellow Gaddix engines and the blue and yellow Gaddix engines. Gaddix meaning the General American Transportation Company, I think that's what it stands for. Pretty sure that's what it stands for. Preferred lease management still exists to this day, but I don't know if they're still leasing locomotives. I do know that they lease truck trailers. In fact, I pulled I pulled several of them back. Well, it's it's been a while now, but I pulled several of their trailers. The GP40 was introduced in 1966 as an evolution of the GP35. Along with the GP38 and similar SD series units, it marked the introduction of EMD 645 series engine, which used the same engine block dimensions as the 567 series, but incorporated modified power assemblies with a larger cylinder bore. In the GP40, a 16-cylinder turbocharged version of the engine produced 3,000 horsepower. The GP40 also used an alternator rectifier electrical system addressing one of the biggest reliability concerns of the GP35 in which the DC generator required 16 stages of transition to handle a 2500 horsepower output. The GP38 was a 16 cylinder non-turbocharged roots blown model that produced 2000 horsepower initially using a DC generator and later in the GP38 AC using the same AR10 alternator as the GP40. The GP39, introduced a couple of years later, used a turbocharged 12-cylinder engine producing 2,300 horsepower. Both the GP38 and GP40 were fairly strong sellers, together accounting for more than 2,000 locomotives built, although only 23 GP39s were ever built, most for the Chesapeake and Ohio. In 1972, EMD introduced an updated Dash 2 series that replaced the GP38, the GP39, and the GP40 with the GP38-2, the GP39-2 and the GP40-2, respectively. Many GP38s and GP38 ACs remained in service with their original owners or their successors well into the 21st century. GP40s in their original form started to disappear from the Class 1 railroads in the 1990s, but many were rebuilt or continued in service on smaller railroads. A fairly large number of GP38s and GP40s have received upgraded Dash 2 modular or Dash 3 microprocessor electrical systems and a number of GP40s have been converted to GP38 variations by the replacement of the turbocharger with a roots blower. <laughs> 
The increase from 2,500 to 3,000 horsepower necessitated a larger radiator section with three 48-inch fans in place of the one 36-inch and two 48-inch fans that was found on the GP35. The GP40 adopted the general hood dimensions and radiator design of the last two SD40X demonstrators, which were based on the SD35. This increased the overall length from 56 feet 2 inches to 59 feet 2 inches. The rear truck was moved one foot inward from the rear pilot face, making it symmetrical with the front truck and resulting in 34-foot truck centers compared to the 32-foot on the GP35. The longer frame allowed for a longer fuel tank, which increased in capacity to 3,600 gallons, although smaller sizes were also used. The walkway side frame was 5 inches tall above the air reservoirs compared to 3 inches on the late GP35 or 7 inches on the early GP35. And air piping was relocated inboard of the air reservoirs rather than on the outside. On the hood, the dynamic brake fan and intakes were moved rearward and the taper of the dynamic brake hatch was made steeper at the rear than the front. Aside from this and the longer radiator section, the cab and hood were otherwise the same between the late GP35 and the early GP40. As on the GP28, which was the non-turbocharged version of the GP35, the GP38 used the same hood design as the GP40, but incorporated shorter radiator intakes with only two 48-inch fans and two exhaust stacks in place of the single turbocharger stack. By the early 1970s, many first-generation diesels were reaching the end of their service lives. The most common replacement locomotives became the GP40-2. EMD began production of the 16-cylinder turbocharged 3,000 horsepower engine in 1972. These locomotives were developed for service where higher horsepower and faster service were preferable. A major feature for the GP40-2 was the introduction of the Dash 2 modular electrical cabinet. For more than 40 years, the GP40-2 worked mainline freights, locals, switching jobs, yard service, and helper service, and many remain in service to this day. The GP40-2 was introduced by EMD in 1972 as a replacement for the GP40. It retained the same 3,000 horsepower 645 series engine but received a host of mechanical and electrical upgrades geared at improving reliability and ease of maintenance. Production continued until the end of 1986. The GP50, which we talked about earlier, was introduced in 1980 and was built concurrently with the late GP40-2 production and both were succeeded by the GP60. Like the GP40, the GP40-2 can be identified by having four axles, three 48-inch radiator cooling fans, and a clean-lined hood with a single turbocharger exhaust stack that was changed to a flat silencer housing on later units.
While the overall dimensions and proportions were retained with the start of the Dash 2 series, many small detail changes were made to the entire locomotive. As a result, almost every part of the cab and hood was changed in some way. Far too much to get into in this video. Like its four-axle cousin, the SD40 was introduced in 1966 as an evolution of the SD35. It marked the introduction of EMD's 645 series engine, which used the same engine block dimensions as the 567 series but incorporated modified power assemblies with a larger cylinder bore. The SD40 also used an alternator rectifier electrical system addressing one of the biggest reliability concerns of the SD35, in which the DC generator required nine stages of transition to handle a 2500 horsepower output. Along with the SD40, which used a 3000 horsepower 16 cylinder turbocharged engine, three other variations were introduced. The SD38, which used a 2000 horsepower roots blown engine replacing the SD28. The SD45, which used a 3600 horsepower 20 cylinder engine. And a couple of years later, the SD39, which used a 2300 horsepower 12 cylinder engine. The SD38 initially used a DC generator, but later in the SD38 AC, used the same AR10 alternator as the SD40. While only a few dozen of each of the SD38 and SD39 were sold, the SD40 and SD45 both sold more than 1,200 locomotives, marking the first time that EMD's SD series outsold their four-axle general purpose counterparts. The SD45 also marked the end of EMD's horsepower race of the 1960s with the comparative reliability and versatility of the 3,000 horsepower SD40 paving the way for the hugely successful SD40-2. And despite popular myth, and I hope that I can finally put this myth to rest once and for all, the SD45 was no less fuel efficient than the SD40 on a per horsepower basis. The 20% increase in horsepower and fuel consumption came with neither an increase in fuel capacity nor intractive effort at low speeds, where weight and adhesion could be the limiting factor. In 1972, EMD introduced an updated Dash 2 series replacing the SD38, the SD40, and the SD45 with the SD38-2, the SD40-2, and the SD45-2, respectively. And SD39-2 was apparently cataloged but was never built. While some SD40s and SD45s were retired by the 1990s, many more continued in service into the 21st century, often in modified or rebuilt form. Many SD40s received upgraded Dash 2 modular or Dash 3 microprocessor electrical systems. A number of SD45s were derated from their original 3600 horsepower rating, either through derating the original 20 cylinder engine or replacing it with the 16 cylinder version. This is a TFM locomotive, the old Kansas City, well, I shouldn't say the old Kansas City Southern New Mexico, the new Kansas City Southern New Mexico, but the railroad is the Transportacion. Faro Via, Viaria Mexicana is the name of a company dedicated to freight transportation using rail in the northeastern part of Mexico. KCSM is fully owned and operated by Kansas City Southern who owns who owns its fleet and the rights to operate and maintain a rail system through a concession from the Mexican government. The majority of the rail system spans from the Mexico City Valley to the United States border at Laredo, Texas. There are also tracks that connect to the port cities of Lazario, Cardenas, and Veracruz, giving Kansas City Southern to Mexico a unique position because they connect both the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean to the United States border. Kansas City Southern to Mexico was originally formed in 1996 when Kansas City Southern Industries and Transportacion Marit Tima Mexicana, TMM, purchased a government concession to operate on a rail system in Mexico. It was the Mexican president, Ernesto Zedillo, who proposed the privatization 
of the Mexican railways because the Mexican railway system had fallen into a state of disrepair and needed drastic work to, to become profitable. Since the late 1930s, Mexican trains and tracks were properly were property of the government as Faro... Mm, okay, this is the, the Nationalist de Mexico. The nationalized railroad operated successfully for many years, yet by the 1990s, the system was so poorly run that U.S. railways would not even send rail cars into Mexico for fear that they would not be returned. When the decision to privatize the railroad was made, only 15% of freight was moved by rail in Mexico versus 42% in the U.S. The most sought-after portion of the concessions, called the Northeast Railroad, was bid on by major companies, including the United States' largest railroad company, the Union Pacific. This concession included about 3,600 kilometers, 2,261 miles of track, which, with connections to many key cities, including Monterey, Mexico City, and Laredo. This track carried 40% of all rail traffic in Mexico and 60% of all rail traffic coming from the United States. KCSM and TMM bid and won the concession for $1.4 billion in United States dollars for the right to operate the concession, paying 49% and 51% respectively. In 2005, Kansas City Southern Industries purchased Transportación Maritima Mexicana share in TFM, giving them full ownership of the company, and the TFM was officially renamed Kansas City Southern to Mexico, The biggest change from the SD35 was a longer underframe with the length over the coupler pulling faces increased from 60 feet 8 inches on the SD35 to either 65 feet 8 inches or 65 feet 9 and a half inches depending on whether the end plates were 0.75 inches or 1 and a half inches thick. On the SD45, the twin cylinder engine and longer radiators with flared intakes took up all of the additional frame length, but on the three other models, the shorter hood left porches at either end that, while not as long as on the later SD40-2, still left several feet of empty walkway space. The longer underframe allowed for a significantly longer fuel tank with a standard fuel capacity of 4,000 gallons, although smaller tanks were sometimes used. The walkway side frame was 5 inches tall above the air reservoirs compared to 3 inches on the SD35, and air piping was relocated inboard of the air reservoirs as on the last SD35 orders for the Southern Railway. Also like the GP40, the increase from 2,500 to 3,000 horsepower necessitated a larger radiator section with three 48-inch fans in place of the one 36-inch and two 48-inch fans on the SD35. The SD40 adopted the general hood dimensions and radiator design of the last two SD40X demonstrators, but also lengthened the front hood section housing the inertial air intakes and equipment blower duct by about 15 inches. The taper of the dynamic brake hatch was made steeper at the rear than the front to make room for the longer radiator intakes. Aside from these changes, the cab and hood were very similar between the late SD35 and early SD40. As on the SD28, the SD38 used the same hood design as the SD40 but incorporated shorter radiator intakes with only two 48-inch fans and two exhaust stacks in place of a single turbocharger stack. 
SD38-2, SD40-2, and SD45-2 were introduced in 1972 as replacements for the SD38, the SD40, and the SD45 respectively. They retained the same respective horsepower ratings but received a host of mechanical and electrical upgrades with the most visible difference being the longer frame with HTC trucks. While the SD38-2 and SD45-2 were relatively slow sellers and ceased production in the 1970s, thousands of the SD40-2 variations were built as it became the most popular locomotive of the late 20th century and as of the title of this video states the greatest diesel locomotive ever built with peak production in the late 1970s and the last variant the full cowl SD40-2F built in 1988. The SD38-2 and SD40-2 were very similar externally with the relatively long frame and short hood resulting in a large porches at either end. The SD38-2 had two radiator fans and two exhaust stacks, while the SD40-2 had three radiator fans and a single turbocharger exhaust stack, which was changed to a flat silencer housing on later units. The SD45-2 had a single exhaust stack and three radiator fans spread out over a distinctively longer hood that filled the extra frame length. Tunnel motor variants, the SD40T-2 and SD45T-2, rode on a still longer frame and had a redesigned radiator area with low air intakes, internal fans, and roof-mounted radiator grills. Wide-nosed units that were built for Canadian National were otherwise similar to other SD40-2s, but the full cowl body SD40-2F built for Canadian Pacific was in fact closely derived from the SD50F built for the Canadian National, and its car body and general construction had little in common with other SD40-2s. On all six axle dash two units, the frame was lengthened by just over three feet to accommodate the longer HTC trucks while keeping enough room for the standard 4,000 gallon fuel tank. Depending on the thickness of the pilot end plates, either 0.75 inches or one and a half inches, the overall length was either 68 feet, eight and a half inches, or 68 feet, 10 inches, compared to the 65 feet, eight inches, or 65 feet, nine and a half inches for the SD38, SD40, and the SD45. The SD40T-2 and SD45T-2 were built to an overall length of 70 feet, eight inches with one and a half inch end plates. The HTC truck looked superficially similar to the earlier flexi-coil truck, but it was a substantially different design with an all new frame casting, taller primary springs, stiffer rubber pads for the secondary suspension, slightly unequal axle spacing, and all traction motors facing in the same direction, which was the reason for the added length. The wheelbase between the center axles, often mistakenly cited as 43 feet 6 inches, was in fact 43 feet 3 and a half inches. The 43 feet 6 inch dimension was for the bolster centers as the bolster on HTC trucks was offset outward by one and a quarter inches from the center axle. The longer frame was retained on Conrail units that were built with flexi-coil trucks, leaving a large gap between the trucks and the fuel tank. Railroad diagrams list the bolster centers on flexi-coil equipped units as 43 feet 6 inches, but as the flexi-coil bolster lined up with the middle axle, such a dimension would put the trucks too far toward the ends and possibly cause greater clearance issues with the steps and draft gear. On all 6 axle dash 2 units, the front section of the hood housing the inertial air intakes and blower duct was lengthened by roughly 8 inches. On the SD38-2 and SD40-2, this added length was not enough to compensate for the increased frame length, and the result was a significantly larger platform at either end, with the rearmost wheel entirely out from under the end of the hood. On the SD45-2, however, the rear of the hood was also lengthened to fill up the extra frame length, and the added space was used to house longer, narrower radiators that did not require the canted intakes used on the SD45. The longer radiators resulted in three very widely spaced rooftop radiator fans. At the start of the EMD-2 production, almost every part of the cabin hood was changed in some way. The SD40-2 was widely heralded as the greatest diesel locomotive that was ever built. 
Many Class 1 railroads have bumped them to yard and local service, and over on the NS, the SD-60E, which had replaced the SD-60Ms and the SD-60Is in coal service and mineral service, are now replacing the 40s in many local jobs. The transition from the GMD SD40 to the SD40-2 was generally the same as for their EMD counterparts. Most of the phase changes occurred at the same time as an EMD SD40-2 production, although a few minor changes occurred later. Some of the features generally associated with GMD locomotive production, such as vertical corner steps and nose-mounted headlights, were more a question of railroad specifications than of differences from EMD. When GMD built several orders of SD40-2s for Burlington Northern while EMD was at capacity, they were virtually identical to their U.S. built counterparts. Likewise, when EMD built an order of early Canadian Pacific SD40-2s, they were built to GMD CP specs. 
Formed in 1971, Amtrak took over operation of most of America's passenger trains with an assortment of old locomotives, primarily decades-old E-units. The carrier worked with General Motors Electromotive Division to design new passenger locomotives. The result was the SDP-40F, built by EMD from 1973 through 1974 for Amtrak for a brief time they formed the backbone of Amtrak's long-distance passenger fleet. With 150 built, the STP-40F became the face of Amtrak in the mid-1970s as they were found on the head ends of passenger trains from San Diego to Washington, D.C. and from Seattle to Miami. Several were rebuilt and found a second life with the Santa Fe Railway in freight service. The design of the SDP-40F was based on the EMD FP-45 passenger locomotive. Both shared the EMD 645E3 diesel engine, although the SDP-40F had 16 cylinders instead of 20. The space saved from the smaller prime mover was given over to increased water capacity. The SDP-40F had an underbody tank split between water and diesel fuel carrying 2,000 gallons of water and 2,500 gallons of diesel. A second 1,500-gallon water tank sat in the car body forward of the steam generators which produced the steam needed for supplying heat and sometimes cooling and hot water for the train. Eventually, the SDP-40F was phased out as all electric cars such as the Amfleet displaced the old steam heating rolling stock. While the SDP-40F was designed with conversion to head-in power in mind, the bad press they received cost to upgrade and overhaul the units and Amtrak's satisfaction with the versatility of the HEP-equipped F40PH ultimately doomed the SDP-40F. Amtrak was able to trade in the SDP-40F's two EMD as more F40PH units were acquired in the late 1970s. The last SDP-40F was retired from Amtrak in the early 1980s. In 1984, the Santa Fe Railway traded lower power locomotives to Amtrak for 18 SDP-40Fs, horsepower for horsepower. The SDP-40Fs were reconditioned in the railroad San Bernardino, California shops to the designation of the SDF-40-2 for use as freight locomotives. Santa Fe replaced the hollow HTC bolsters with conventional HTC bolsters, converted the below frame combination fuel water tank to an all fuel tank, removed the above frame water tanks replacing these with concrete ballast, something that you often see on today's slug units, and used the engines for nearly 50 years. They were also given front steps and platforms. Their noses were notched after a second maintenance shop visit in order to improve boarding access. In exchange, Amtrak received 43 smaller locomotives for use in switching service. I think that a major issue at EMD during this transition time from the Dash 2 era was how long EMD had stuck with their successful product lineups. By the time they decided to replace them and introduce a new model line, much of the engineering staff that was experienced with past model introductions had retired or moved on to New Horizons. What was left was an engineering base that predominantly had never designed and brought to life a new model of locomotive. Faced with an almost impossible task to live up to, expectations set by what many consider the greatest locomotive design of all time with the SD40-2. And after so many years of living off of the laurels of EMD's GP38, SD40, and GP40 line and the subsequent Dash 2 versions, they naturally faltered. Customers that had gotten accustomed to the problem-free EMD suddenly didn't have such a great memory anymore and had no patience to see the teething troubles out with new locomotives, with several notables leaving the fold at this time and others upping the percentage of GEs that were being bought. Yet ironically, it was the SD60s that soured CSX on EMDs after being reasonably pleased with the SD50s. Go figure. That's a relationship that, to this day, LaGrange has yet to really restore, with just small orders here and there since then. The CNW is another one that was less than pleased, at least in the service that they were initially intended for. Despite a very unpleasant experience with seven U30Cs in the 1970s, they switched to GE in the wake of their SD60 order, although the relationship couldn't have been too badly damaged because if you recall, had the CNW had remained an independent railroad, the SD80 Max were in their future. Santa Fe was upset by how rough riding the GP60 turned out to be. 
It makes you wonder how could EMD that had been turning out wide cab locomotives for the Canadian National in 4-axle and 6-axle models screw up so badly on that one. Then throw in EMD insisting for years on staying with the one inverter per truck while GE was offering the one inverter per axle. We talked about this in my first volume of my EMD versus GE series with the SD70 Mac versus the AC4400 CW. The simple fact was that GE started offering a better product, at least for a time anyway. Except for the Burlington Northern and Union Pacific's major orders, there really weren't any EMD orders of more than 300 units at one time. Now to be fair, GE's B40-AWs rode about as bad as the GP60Ms as both were exceptionally rough riding. Both the GP60M and the B40-AWs were renowned for their rough riding characteristics, truck hunting and bouncing at grade crossings and crossovers. Yeah, everything I've read says that Dash 8s were at best marginally better behaved than the 60Ms, and both were horrible. Also, everything I've read about the GP40-2Ls and especially the GP40-2Ws was that they were close to, if not as bad as the GP60Ms. So I guess the Santa Fe knew what they were getting for their money. The Santa Fe wanted a design that was going to bounce a lot. I guess they knew that up front because the CN units rode rough too. EMD and GE both did their best to account for that. But again, they were what the Santa Fe asked for and both companies built rough riding units, so that's not an indicator of the problem. I can't help but wonder why all the GP60s and 60Ms and SD70Is and SD70Ms are getting rebuilt on the Bensep if they're so bad. But I'm guessing in the case of the GP60Ms, I'm pretty sure the answer is CARB, the California Air Resources Board, and the BNSF and Union Pacific voluntarily agreed with them on some kind of fleet emission standards. Furthermore, the Santa Fe bought 83 A40 BWs and 63 GP 60Ms plus 23 Jeep 60Bs. The 60Ms was the lower horsepower locomotive, which would mean a slower train speed overall. They also bought 102 SD 75Is and Ms, a unit specifically designed for the Santa Fe that upped the horsepower of the SD 70M because Santa Fe wanted EMD to match the Dash 9s. The GP60Ms are still on the roster today. The Dash 8s of all flavors mostly are not. The GP60Ms and Dash 840BWs ride rough because they are very heavy for four axles and have the heavy cab on one end. Santa Fe might not have asked for a rough riding unit, who knows, but that is what they received after specifying those parameters. The Jeep60Ms are being rebuilt for use as local power where they've been for years and they are cleaner burning than BNSF's other four axles which keeps carb happy. A lot of the four axle Dash 8s are still around on the Ben Seth though they're steadily, steadily dwindling. The SD70M-2 units without the isolated cab are loud and are called a real paint shaker. We talked about these in Volume 3 of EMD vs. GE, the first part of the SD70ACE vs. the ES44AC. The ones with the isolated cab are much better, but I'm told they're still not that great. The SD70 and 75 units are good pullers, but I'm told they slip in the slightest amount of moisture on the rails. But they're real crew favorites on the Canadian National. So, what exactly are we looking at? We are looking at another lease unit. This time it's on the Canadian National. That is GCFX number 6057. You know, it's kind of funny. Somebody once told me Canadian National and Canadian Pacific hate each other up there the way that NS and CSX hate each other down here. And in this case, they each seem to have their own preference of lease locomotive. What's interesting about the 6057 is that it started off as a Canadian National locomotive. So it was born a Canadian National locomotive, it became a lease locomotive, it was leased back to Canadian National, and then it went on to other railroads, and that's what we're going to talk about in this video. It was built in May of 1971 as Canadian National number 5193 as an SD40, a straight SD40 with no dynamic brakes. Keep that in mind. It was built as a straight SD40 with no dynamic brakes. Looking at this picture here, you can see the flexi-coil style trucks that were popular on Conrail SD40-2s and also their SD50s. The SD60s had the new HTCR trucks, I believe that's what they, yeah, yeah, the new HTCR trucks the Conrail SD60s had. Looking behind the cab, you can see the louvers over the air intakes there. I don't know what the techni technically correct term is for those. I always call them snow sheds. But some American locomotives had them too. I'm pretty sure that the Sioux line had some engines that had those. And I think the CNW, the Chicago Northwestern, had some engines that had them. And there might have been some other ones too. I, I could be wrong on that, but I think at least those two did have them. You typically see these on locomotives that deal with cold weather, particularly up north and a lot of snow. Because that's what they're for. They're, they're for 
to keep snow out of those air intakes. So moving along here, we're looking at uh, 31T getting ready to head into Solomon's Gap. And from there, it'll cruise on down the hill and it'll, it will end up at a place called Laurel Run. Now, Laurel Run is a place that will forever live in infamy in Lehigh Valley history because Lehigh Valley and CNJ history because there was a big accident here back in I want to say it was 1969 but uh you know what I I can't remember the year but there was a big accident a CNJ train and a Lehigh Valley train collided head on and what was unusual about the accident, about the incident, was the fact that only Alco diesels were involved in the wreck. There were no EMD or GE diesels involved. It was all Alcos. But nonetheless, getting back to this engine here. So what exactly do we know about this engine? Well, we know that it was built as a straight SD40 in May of 1971 for the Canadian National. It was rebuilt into the SD40-3 that you see here by a company, a French company in Canada that was rebuilding and testing locomotives. That company being Alstom, which was reorganized in 1998. During the rebuilding process, it had dynamic brakes added to it and it was painted the, in the orange or gray scheme that you see here and was leased back to the Canadian National in the late 1990s. From Canadian National, it went to the Quebec Gatineau Railway in Montreal, Quebec. And now, where's the number 3334 that you see here? Interesting about the Quebec Gatineau Railway, it's a relatively new railroad that was formed in the late 90s, 1998 if I'm not mistaken, from former Canadian Pacific Lines. Now, I know I'm going to butcher this, so I'm going to put it up on the screen for you, but the lines that it took over from CP was the Trois Revere and Lachute subdivisions, God forbid, between Quebec City and Montreal, and some lines also in Gatineau, spurs, running rights, stuff like that. When you when you take when you take all that into consideration, the railroad is just under 300 miles, 298 to be exact, if I'm not mistaken. Locomotives are constructed to operate in all types of climates, from scorching desert heat to frigid mountain winters. An ample supply of fresh air is required at all times for cooling and combustion. In the 1960s and 1970s, when trains operated through long tunnels or snowsheds at slow speeds, the ability of a unit to receive large amounts of air cool enough to dissipate heat was an issue for the Western Railroads, notably the Southern Pacific and the Rio Grande. Before the introduction of microprocessor technology, locomotives did not self-govern and would quickly overheat and fail in these conditions. SP had a policy of running long, heavy, slow trains through the tunnels. When you run slow, heavy trains, the diesel spend more time in the tunnels. EMDs have higher radiator intakes that suck in hot air from the upper parts of the tunnel. Evidently, Union Pacific, Burlington Northern, and others run their trains fast enough that they get out of the tunnels quick enough that the hot air does not affect them as much. SP did until they bought the tunnel motors instead. There's actually a story in Trains Magazine a few years back about EMD telling SP that they should run shorter, faster trains, and SP ignoring that advice. Ergo, they purchased the tunnel motors to cope with the extensive exposure to hot cooling air. In the 1990s, SP bought a lot of GEs, which normally have lower cooling intakes, which makes all GEs de facto tunnel motors as all Alcos. 
That sounds all dandy, but I guess the crews don't like that. According to Doug Rydell, a former Seaboard CSX engineer, when you walk past the radiator intake with the fan on, it sucked any loose clothing over the grate surface and it got really dirty. The wire mesh that I'm referring to is a wire grill pressed into a series of V's and it collects leaves and trash that would otherwise be sucked into the radiators and clog them. Think like a giant bug screen on the grill of a car. The openings are larger, square footage wise, than a standard SD model for improved airflow and for more air volume. The SD45 T-2 is a variant of the venerable SD45 that featured the Dash 2 upgrade components such as improved electronics and high traction trucks with the T denoting its cooling system modification. The intake for radiator cooling air was moved to the walkway level and the cooling fans themselves were under the radiator cores instead of above. Tunnel motors were built for mountainous regions in the United States, the western United States to be specific, where SP had previously encountered repeating overheating issues on their SD45s. The later SD40T-2 looks similar to the SD45T-2. One spotting difference is the longer hood on the SD45T-2 to accommodate the V20 prime mover versus the V16 used on the SD40T-2. The SD45T-2's cab is further forward on the frame so there is less front porch. This mimics the differences between the SD45-2 and the SD40-2. Another spotting difference is the SD45T-2's three fan access doors on each side above the cooling air intake while the SD40T-2 has only two. The unique SD40T-2 tunnel motor was the backbone of the Rio Grande and the Southern Pacific fleets during the 1970s and the 1980s. They were distinguished by the large see-through radiator grills at the rear of the locomotive just above the walkway. Like their SD40T-2, some of SP's SD45T-2 tunnel motors were obtained by the Kansas City Southern Railway, the Bessemer and Lake Erie Railroad, the Duluth, Mesabi, and Iron Range Railway, and by the Union Pacific Railroad when it merged the SP in 1996. Some SD45T-2s were rebuilt and designated to SD45T-3, SD40T-3, and SD40-2T. In addition, some locomotive leasing companies own the SD45 tunnel motor locomotives. They are scattered all over the United States today and unfortunately are becoming more and more an increasingly rare sight. Early attempts to address overheating including adding a water spray system on the radiators to improve cooling. This was followed by the application of elephant ears that ducted air from a lower point on the side of the locomotive and into the radiators. Both solutions had various degrees of success and contributed to the development of EMD's tunnel motor design which used the low air intake vents on the long hood and a cold side radiator fan system. This design places radiator fans between the intake and the radiators which pushes a larger volume of cool air through the radiators versus a hot side fan system found on EMD hood units that pulls hot air exiting the car body. Several railroads including the Canadian Pacific and the Chessie system and even the MRS in Brazil tested the elephant ear concept in an attempt to overdress overheating issues but never ordered the tunnel motors. EMD's first tunnel motor, the SD45T-2, was the modified version of the SD40-2 as we just talked about. Southern Pacific and subsidiary Cotton Belt were the only buyers ordering 247 copies between 1972 and 1975. The tunnel motor variant of the highly successful SD40-2, the SD40T-2, gained slightly more buyers at 312, split between the Southern Pacific, the Cotton Belt, and the Rio Grande, orders that spanned from 1974 through the 1980. While no four-axle tunnel motors were ever ordered, EMD did design a tunnel motor version of the GP50 called the GP50T for the Rio Grande. Unfortunately, an unexpected order for 12 GP50Ts was never finalized and the design went unbuilt. The cold side radiator fan design with side air inlets used on the SD40T-2 and the SD45T-2s was applied to other EMD products in North America, such as the MP15AC, the MP15T, the GP15-1, the GP15AC, and the GP15T. Many EMD products around the world which were already using cold side radiator fans also received the new radiator design. Eventually, the tunnel motors that were built for the Southern Pacific and the Rio Grande, still on the roster in 1996, ended up in the employ of the Union Pacific. The majority of the tunnel motors were purged from UP's roster in the 2000s, ending up on dozens of other Class 1 railroads, short lines, regionals, and lease fleets across North America.
Canadian National is the only Class 1 railroad operating the tunnel motor design today. It inherited two separate fleets of SD-45 T-2s rebuilt mechanically to SD-40-3s during its acquisition of the Bessemer and Lake Erie in 2004 and the Duluth, Masabi and Iron Rage in 2011. Today, its fleet of 20 tunnel motors sees service primarily on Canadian National's iron ore operations in the upper Midwest. Mexico's Ferrocer, now Ferromex, reintroduced the elephant ear concept with 15 SD-70 Aces constructed by EMD in early 2015. The tunnel motor concept using cold side fans would most likely not be feasible with the size of the radiator systems in today's locomotives, hence the application of the less efficient elephant ears. To compensate, these locomotives take advantage of the microprocessor system and GPS equipment on board that can adjust certain aspects of the locomotive, such as cooling the fluids in the radiator system below normal levels prior to entering tunnels on the railroad. As we move into 2022, it's hard to imagine that even in this era of boxy, cardboard cutout locomotive designs, you can still find a lot of unique personality on today's railroads, even the Class 1s. <laughs> 
In the last video of this series, we talked about the tunnel motor variants of the ST40 and ST45-2 EMD models. Local area rail fans may be shocked to learn that in addition to the eclectic mix of early diesels on their roster, the Reading and Northern had at least one tunnel motor as evidenced by the 8354 shown in Pittston Yard in the early 2000s. Just check out the reporting mark stenciled above the air intake. With the increased cost and complexity of new locomotives, many railroads are finding a renewed appetite and enthusiasm for rebuilding, upgrading, and modernization new programs for older power. And as PSR continues to take hold on the big Class 1s, traditional business operating models are being mothballed as diesel locomotive builders team up with railroad shops and contract shops in the reincarnation and reviving of motor power makeovers to firm new levels. It would seem that for the first time, a new era in the production of diesel locomotives has begun, where upgrades and new locomotive sales are considered pretty much on equal footing. From the relatively simple but effective Dash 3 upgrades such as those found on the CSX, to the more complicated DC to AC conversions, to EMD eco repowering packages and even the past AC refreshing programs for the SD70 Max, SD90 Max, even the GE AC 4400s, rebuilding has become the latest fashion in modern day railroading. By far, the clear champion in motor power modernity is the Norfolk Southern. With the Juniata shops that it inherited from Conrail, NS maintains a long-standing practice of conducting in-house locomotive remanufacturing programs. The shops at Juniata ranks as one of the most productive locomotive shops in the world. In these historic halls, generations of workers of the PRR once built and rebuilt everything from the tiniest O4Os to the mightiest K4 Pacifics. J1 Class 2104s and Duplex Drive 4464Q2s and 44. 44T1s, not to mention the GG1 electrics. NS employees uphold the age-old traditions of transforming tired and worn-out SWs, Jeeps, the big SDs, and even GEs into better-than-new locomotives. Just two years ago, the Norfolk Southern had a wide variety of SD40-2s from all over the place on its roster of just under 4,000 locomotives. In fact, if you remember, I pointed out in video T167 that one-eighth of the entire NS diesel locomotive roster was SD40-2s at the time. With all of the talk that we've done about the big six-axle road locomotives, it can't be forgotten that the trend toward locomotive modernization began with the four-axle Jeeps, which included some of the oldest power in North America. And even with PSR and changes in operating philosophy, the cannibalization of some routes and the consolidation and downsizing of many secondary fleets, Class 1 railroads still operate some 7,000 EMD Jeeps and SDs. Four- and six-axle road switchers remain the backbone of secondary fleets, and to capitalize on this market, builders like Rail Power, NREC, and Motive Power have also been modernizing older EMDs, along with EMD itself, who in 2010 re-entered the fray with its 710 Eco Repower diesel line. Canadian Pacific took the Eco program very seriously, but also had to face some hard facts about its GP7 and GP9 fleet. Despite significant upgrades made in the 1980s, the fleet, originally from the 1950s, had reached a critical point in their lives. And given that they represented 11% of CP's power and operated system-wide, there was no way the endearing EMDs could be ignored. Progress Rail came in with a solution, the GP20C-ECO. Taking the Jeeps in trade and salvaging key components to meet EPA rules, the GP20C-ECO offered up a new road switcher design complete with an 8-cylinder 710 engine that was rated at 2,000 horsepower. Existing trucks and some other components were kept. However, the GP20 model featured a new underframe, operator cabs, and hood. CP initially rebuilt 30 units in 2012 through 2013, but quickly returned for 100 more over the course of two years and in one swift stroke. Approximately 130 GP20 C Ecos replaced CP's entire fleet of first generation Jeeps. Now that's what I call progress. And CP's eco ambitions didn't stop there. The railway contracted Progress Rail yet again, this time to rebuild 20 retired SD40 2s as the SD30 C Eco. At the Mayfield, Kentucky facility, the locomotives were stripped down to the frame and rebuilt with the 12 cylinder 710 engine. New crash-worthy cab and microprocessor controls with an upgraded cooling system complete with larger flared radiators akin to the legendary SD45 of the 1960s. Moving our way to the south, even CSX dabbled in the Ecos products game with the SD33 Ecos. 
also rebuilt from SD40-2 cores, the units were delivered in 2017. Designated as the SD40-E3, changes in CSX management a la 1E Hunter Harrison stalled and maybe stopped any further rebuilds and upgrades from being completed. Of course, not every railroad can justify the money to fully ecoize their fleets. For those who can't or won't, a variety of solutions still remain. The most common one is the traditional overhaul of Jeeps and SDs, which extends their lives. Most secondary fleets only run a fraction of the mileage and megawatt hours of the road units, so diesels upgraded and overhauled for this purpose will be ready for another generation of service. During August of 2017, the Juniata shops completed the SD33 Eco number 6215, the sixth rebuild of an SD40, SD40-2 into this new NS model. The 6215 began its career in 1968 as Kansas City Southern number 620 and was one of 10 former KCS SD40s acquired by Conrail in 1993 from Packrail leasing for a Dash 2 rebuilding program. Upon completion, it became Conrail number 6970 and later NS number 3431. The five prior SD33 Eco units, number 6210 through 6214, were completed in 2016. Along with the other Eco units, the 6215 has the two-tone green band added to the standard NS colors. The first five worked at Macon, Georgia's Brosnan Yard with the 6215 eventually being assigned to Atlanta. These engines have been called eco-locomotives because they are designed with operating efficiencies that reduce emissions and fuel consumption. The 3,000 horsepower engines are Tier 3 compliant. Utilizing GP38 ACs, GP50s, and GP59s as core locomotives, Juniata turned out fleets of GP22s, GP33s, and GP59 Ecos. Outfitted with the NS Design Crescent cabs and upgraded with split cooling systems and new microprocessor controls, Juniata has churned out well over 130 SD60Es that were built from the cores of SD60s. There is a group of 24 units that were acquired from National Railway Equipment by NS in 2012 that have black number boards with white lettering instead of the usual white number boards with black lettering that are common to NS locomotives. The units number 3468 through 3491 had their number boards replaced by NRE with their new NS numbers prior to being delivered resulting in the color reversal. Ex-Norfolk and Western, now Norfolk Southern SD40-2 number 6205 is one of a handful of ex-NNW SDs that have zebra stripes on the front and rear plow. Shown mingling in a Nola yard in a cluster of NS diesels and again in Allentown with the zebra stripes in full view, it's one of a handful of ex-NNW SD40s that are primarily used in switching and hump yard service around the NS system. Over on the NSD&H Sunbury line, there's a small group of locomotives that have been given a heritage status that's unique to this historical railroad. I call them the D&H class. And although the D&H is no longer with us in northeastern Pennsylvania, for a time afterward its memory and legacy lived on in a handful of black and white diesels with decals that paid tribute to the past. Unfortunately, the D&H class SD40-2s were also part of the Blackboard Brigade, and all, if not most, were retired in 2020. During the mid-1980s, Guilford's gray locomotives were an everyday sight in northeastern Pennsylvania. In 1984, the Delaware and Hudson became a part of the Guilford Transportation Company, and the D&H's history as an independent railroad ended. Guilford operated the D&H until about 1988 when it placed it into bankruptcy and limbo until the Canadian Pacific bought it in 1991. The three locomotives in this picture are all dead in tow. The train is being powered by two closely related EMD SD70 ACEs, numbers 1077 and 1090. The center of our attention is the beleaguered and battle squad Boston and Main GP40. It was built in December of 1968 as the Penn Central number 3236 and was transferred to Conrail as the same road number before becoming the Boston and Main number 3236, the Springfield Terminal number 340, and the Boston and Main number 340. Guilford Transportation Industries became Pan Am Railways and blue Pan Am locomotives were common on this train and its sister train the 11R slash 11Z from the time that NS took over the line in 2015 to about mid to late 2016. After that, Pan Am locomotives became sporadic and rare but did show up occasionally, even on the 36T, 37T, Allentown and Buffalo bound trains. In other news about this particular train, it ran into trouble 19 miles up the line at milepost 652 around Factoryville. 
After the lead engine shut down at least two times, it was isolated and the 3604 was put online and the trailing 1090 and 3604 had to limp the train into Binghamton, New York. Main Central number 509 that I caught here on March 30, 2016 is the former Canadian National GP40-2 LW number 9641 that was built 40 years to the month that I caught it in March of 1976. When it comes right down to it, railroading in the 21st century is a mixed up mad world of overhauls, modernization programs, and motive power makeovers. Old DCs are going AC, rehabilitated Macs are back in service and better than ever. Best of all, timeless EMD Jeeps and SDs continue to carry on. The SD40 locomotive and its many variants was the pinnacle of EMD's domination of the diesel locomotive market of the 1960s, the 1970s, and part of the 1980s. The downward spiral began with the SD50 and from which EMD has yet to recover. The SD40-2 was, and in still many ways, is the gold star standard of what a diesel locomotive should be. And at half a century old, at least double the expected lifespan of a locomotive today, they've never looked better, sounded better, or performed better. Whether in yard service, local service, or plying the mainline high iron. Here's to you, the EMD SD40-2, the greatest diesel electric locomotive of all time. For Trains 21, call me AC. Just when you thought it was over, here I am coming to you with part 5. Well, actually, this is part 4, or at least part of part 4. When I was making part 4, it was running a little bit longer than I expected it to run in getting it done. And so, to be able to get it done within a reasonable time frame, I had to leave part of it off. So, I'm here now giving you that missing part as part 5. In this little epilogue, I'm just going to go over a couple of SD40-2s that have meant the most to me over the last 30 years or so. Ironically, they're all Canadian Pacific SD40-2s, which is kind of fitting when you think about it because I started off this series talking about the Canadian Pacific SD40-2s and the fact that they had so many on their system. So we start this little epilogue off in 2008 in Albany, New York. I was delivering just down the street from where I caught this southbound DNH train waiting to come into Kenwood Yard. I was delivering to U-Haul, as a matter of fact, you know those little tarp, if you've ever rented a U-Haul truck, those tarps that they uh, rent to you to cover your furniture and stuff like that, well that's what I was delivering. I picked them up in Laredo, Texas, and I was delivering them to, uh, to U-Haul there in Albany. That was the second part of my drop. The first part of my drop was another U-Haul in Newburgh, New York. But anyway, getting along here, that day in Albany, New York. The lead unit was the 5677 and the second unit was the 5690. Now the 567 I ran into three different times over the course of about uh, 10 to 15, 12 years. The first time was in Buttonwood Yard back around 2003 when it was sitting waiting to push up a coal train to Albany, New York as a helper set or as a helper locomotive. The second time I caught it was here in Albany, New York in 2008. And the third time I would catch it would be in 2015 here in Scranton as it led train 259 into Binghamton, New York. 
not only would this be the last time that I saw the 5677, but it would also be the last time that I caught a solid um, SD40-2 lash up on a CP rail train. The second unit, the 5690, I had caught again, I had caught in 2004. And I caught it in Saratoga Springs, New York when it was still painted for the St. Lawrence and Hudson. Now, someone had asked me in one of the comments because I had made a statement about the St. Lawrence and Hudson being ill-fated when it came to CP. And somebody asked me why, what I was talking about. I'll make a video about that. I'm not going to get into it in this video. But the bottom line is the St. Lawrence and Hudson was a Canadian Pacific experiment of the 1990s. And more likely than not, if you're a local rail fan or if you're a rail fan of CP or the DNH and you can remember back to, in the 1990s, you'll know the story of it. If you don't know that story, you will know the story because I'll be doing a video on it in the not too distant future. But at any rate, though, I first caught up with the 5690 in Saratoga Springs Yard in New York in 2004. And this was the second time that I caught up to it here in 2008 in Albany, New York. And I would catch up to it many more times over the course of 2015 as I was waiting for the takeover of NS of the Sunbury Line DNH of the Sunbury Subdivision at that time. The last unit, number 5721, I caught in 2003, again at Buttonwood. This time it was on an outlawed train waiting for a recrew. The original crew that outlawed was kind enough to bring me on board and I was able to get this picture of the engineer. And I'll tell you, you just, you just can't find a more classic looking engineer than that. Now unfortunately you can't tell because of the resolution of the photo, but, the, but take a look at his hat. Now all of those little pins in his hats, those are all DNH and CP rail pins. But the one that's dead center, okay, that's a that's a DNH pin. So this was a DNH man to the core. And to be honest with you, he looks it. By the time the recrew showed up, I was able to get some shots of the exterior of the engine and getting them blasting off south heading toward Enola. It would be another 12 years before I would see the 5721 again. When I did see it, it was no longer a CP rail engine and it was no longer red. This time it was a Lehigh Railway engine and it was now painted black. And while I've caught the CP slash Lehigh Railway 5721 several times since 2015, the real reward for me is just knowing that so many of the CP rail SD40-2s still survive somewhere in North America.